it's good to be with you. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're looking at our series on revolutionary Christianity, and this is the third part. And I uh, hope this has been a blessing to you. And so, without further ado, let's turn to chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 8 to 25. John 14, verse 8 to 25. But before we do, let's come before the Lord. Almighty God, we come before you today. We acknowledge, Lord, our sin. And we acknowledge our failure and our need of you today. And so, Father God, we bow before you now. We ask for your forgiveness and cleansing. And Father, I just pray uh, for this final message. That, Lord, it be blessing people and minister to them and that it would do them good and strengthen them in their walk and in their faith with you. In your name and for your glory, Lord. Amen. Okay. Um, if we turn to John 14, 8 to 25. We read, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father, and the Father in me is, is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works that these he will do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will ask me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is, it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is, is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. Okay. There's a story here. Suddenly we heard the roaring of a noise of an RAF lightning jet fighter. Very low near the water, skimmed over Scarborough Castle and then flew inland. All this all was calm for a, a minute, so until the jet plane came back and went into steep decline and crashed near the beach. That was uh, by Roger Carswell, um, an evangelist, telling the story. He was doing a beach mission in Scarborough, and this plane flew, and they came round and crashed. A jet fighter. It shows us that life is uncertain. We never know what can happen in life. And it says in 1 John 4.10, In this is love, not that we love God, but that we but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So in the midst of life where it's uncertain, we have this gospel where Jesus Christ died for us and gave his life for us. And that is our anchor today. First of all, the Christian life is a life with God. 
Verse 9. Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who's seen me has seen Father. One writer said he wanted them to understand he was not just a prophet, not just a teacher, not just a disciple, master, not only the Messiah, he was the Word made flesh, God incarnate, to be in his presence, to be in the presence, it was to be in the presence of the Father. And that's what God has called you to do today. You're called to walk in the presence of God. That is what the Christian life's about. Verse 10, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather it is the Father living in me, doing his work. If you had the Queen come and visit you, you would give the Queen honour. If you ha had a famous pop star come, you would give them honour, you would want to spend time with them. Do we want to spend time with God? In John 10, 30, it says, I and the Father are one. The Jews could not see that he was God and wanted to kill him. John 10, 31, and again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. I have shown you many great miracles from which, from the Father, from which of these do you stone me? We are called to live in the presence of God. Are we seeing and knowing God deeper today? Number two, uh, sorry, Thomas Brooks says, Christ is a Jew more worth than a thousand worlds. Do we really believe that? Second, a life to serve. You are called to serve Fiona Castle's daughter. Uh, Juicier is very involved with young people at the church and leads a youth group. And she's serving God. You and I have been called to serve God. Verse 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, and he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. God has called you to do great works for him. He wants you to do great works for him. For those who feel unemployed or feel that they haven't got a future, you have a future because God has called you to a purpose. Whatever age you are, you, you can live for mission and serve God. Even if you've been rejected by a mission board, you can still be a, a missionary. Gladys Hayward was a young woman, a cleaner. She was rejected by all the mission boards, but she still went to China and she was a great missionary. Campbell Morgan was rejected by the Methodist Church for, for being a preacher and he went on to be the greatest preacher of the 20th century, mid 20th century. God has a work for you to do. You might be on your back ill. God has a work for you to do. He has a plan and a purpose for your ministry. So, it's a life with God. It's a life of service. It's a life of power. Verse 13. You may ask anything in my name and I will do it. We don't realize the privilege of prayer. Bernard of Claveau says, prayer is a wine which makes glad the heart of man. We don't realize the ministry of prayer, that prayer is powerful. 1 John 15, 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Catherine Marshall said, the purpose of all prayer is to find God's will and to make that will our prayer. We have power because we can pray. Do we use that power? Are we praying for our communities, praying for individuals? Blessings will fall on our church if we pray. Thomas Buxton said, you know the value of prayer. It is precious beyond all price. Never, never neglect it. And then finally, a life in the spirit. Have you ever been on holiday, you go away, you have a couple of weeks away, you come back refreshed and renewed. That's what God does to you by the Holy Spirit. He refreshes you. He renews you. Verse 25, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. This is in John 14. 
He will teach you all things who the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to teach you. The Holy Spirit comes to give you intimacy with God. Without the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. Titus chapter 3 verse 5, He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of the mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. We've poured out with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in our lives dwelling in, in us. Are you frightened of the Holy Spirit? Just because you hear people who are extreme in the teaching and example, don't be frightened of the Holy Spirit. If you feel dry and tired and discouraged, ask the Lord to renew you by the Holy Spirit. You might be a young Christian and remember that the Holy Spirit will teach you His Word and guide you. So, in conclusion, let us walk with God. We have come, we have been called to a life with God, to live for God. We have give, been given a, a, a life to serve. Let us serve God. We have been given a life of power. Let us avail ourselves of that power by prayer. We have been given a life of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us. We are not alone. Let us avail us of ourselves, of the Holy Spirit. Let us ask him to be with us and help us in our daily walk and ministry. Thank you for listening and God bless you. Let's close in prayer and ask the Lord to bless this short little series. And I hope it's blessed you. Father God, we thank you for this day. and We thank you for your love and your grace and your care. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor today. Father, we pray for this ministry of your word today, that you bless it to people's hearts. Father, they might know your love, and they might know your grace and care. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I hope that's been a blessing to you and an encouragement to you today. So God bless you. Hi, folks. <coughs> hope you're okay today. Uh, we're looking at a series uh, on revolutionary Christianity and I uh, hope that you find this a blessing and an encouragement and I hope it, in, it encourages you in your walk with God. So let's come before the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your love and grace. And Father, I pray through these messages that your Holy Spirit would work and their fault will be blessed and encouraged as they come to know you as Lord and Saviour through your word. May they come to be impacted by your word. And may they come to know your love. I ask this, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Verse 31 to 38. It says, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me after. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me truly, I say to you? The rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Chapter 14, verse 1 to 4. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also, may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. 
Jackie Onassis was suffering from a pounding headache and she had cancer and it was taking its toll. Jackie had always been conscious of her place in history and as she was dying she wrote a letter uh, to one of her sons and it said this, Dear John, I understand the pressure you you'll forever have to endure as a Kennedy even though we brought you into this world as an innocent you especially have a place in history no matter what course in life you choose all I can ask is that you and Caroline continue to make me the Kennedy family and yourself proud stay loyal to those who love you love mummy Jackie Onassis or Jackie Kennedy uh, became Onassis later but she knew her place in history she knew her death was a significant time in history and she was getting her family ready for that death and the Lord Jesus also knew a sense of history he knew that it was his time for death and the Lord wanted his disciples to live when he was about to die a revolutionary Christian life a revolutionary discipleship life. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said, the secret of reaping the greatest enjoyment from life is to live dangerously. And this is the whole series that we're going to do. It's a series to encourage us to live dangerously. If you turn to John chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, we read, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him himself and glorify him at once. I want to ask a question. What is significant in your life? What are you bringing glory to today? Are you praising your money or your bank balance? Are you praising your sex life? What is the center of your life and what are you praising at the present time? If you turn to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, we read these words. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. My friend, glory in the Daniel passage is for the Messiah. In our passage in John, glory is to Jesus. Are we living for the glory of God or not? The word glorify means doxia, which means exaltation. Are we exalting God? Are we exalting Christ? Merrill Tenney said the cross would become the supreme glory of God because the Son would completely obey the will of the Father. In the cross is the glory of Christ. When Christ came to die, he was doing the glory of God and therefore he is to be glorified. And do we glorify Christ? Do we glorify him for what he did for us? Philippians 2, verse 4 and 11. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. Here it is, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Glory upon glory upon glory. He gets the glory. Someone said, Rosanna Cash said, you don't appreciate what you have until you lose it. Let me ask you, have we lost sight of the glory of God? Don't we need to come back to that our lives are all about glory in glorifying God? It's not about your ministry. It's not about your family, it's about the glory of God. Is the glory of God the center of our thinking today? 
We think that we are the center. We think that we are important. We think that we are significant. But we're not. History is not marching to our tune. History is marching to the tune of Jesus. And so are we giving him the glory that he deserves. Let us turn to our next part. We've looked at revolutionary glory. Now we're looking at revolutionary love. Verse 34 of John 13. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There's a story of a wife in a chicken pen and her husband was dying, calling for help. She said, you get on with your dying and I'll get on with my plucking. <laughs> she wasn't too caring to her husband. We are all called as Christians to warm friendships and to love one another and to love the poor and the needy. It was a new commandment. What does the Lord mean by a new commandment in terms of love? Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. A new commandment is that the Holy Spirit will come and make a heart of love in you. Jeremiah 31, 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Verse 33. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time declares the Lord I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and that is what God wants to do within you he wants to make the loving person more make you into a more loving person by renewing you by the Holy Spirit that's what it means by a new commandment Ambrose for, for Bishop cried the crowd. Someone shouted and the whole assembly picked up the chant. St. Ambrose was flabbergasted he be, from catatomb, not yet baptized, became a bishop in December the 7th, 374 AD. The first thing he did is he got rid of the wealth and gave it to a, his poor. His door was always open to receive others. He says, so those who have devoted themselves to pleasure, luxury, gains or honors are spectators rather than competence, combatants. They love their ease. End of quote. Do we? God has, wants us to live a revolutionary love today. Teaching on love. John 13, 14. Now that is your Lord and teacher have washed your feet you also wash one another's feet. 1 John 3.23 and this is command 1 John 3.23 and this is his command to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commands us. 1 Thessalonians 4.9 and about brotherly love we do not need to write to you for you yourself have been taught by God to love each other 1 Peter 1.22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3, we ought always to thank God for you brothers and rightly so because your faith is growing more and more and the love of, love, uh, the love of every one of you has for each other is increasing. Galatians 6.2, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. 2 Peter 1 7 and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. And so the question is are we loving today? Christianity is not about being in a club, it's not about being in a, a social group, it's not about being middle class and having a house and a car and a wife or a husband and kids and take, sending them to the best schools and it's all okay. That's not Christianity. Christianity is a revolution of love. It is a place where people are full of the love of God. And so the question is, as children, what are you like as children? Do you love your parents? The question is, as husbands and wives, do you love each other? Do you love your children? It says this, 
50% of teenagers say that dads make no effort to spend time with them. Do you spend time with your children? As a dad, I did. I'd make sure I'd spend more time in my child's life instead of working so much, says one father. Uh, is that with you? And what are you like as a husband and wife? In the area of sex, money, do we, and prayer, are we engaged in love to one another? George Vera says, if your radical discipleship does not start in the home, it has not truly begun. Third, revolutionary grace, verse 36-38. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Have you ever tried to start something, but you failed at it? You've tried to do something, but you've made a mess of it. Well, Peter had done the same. He denied his Lord. He started out in the Christian life, but he, he fell on his face. So often we make mistakes, we are cocky, we say we can go on in the Christian life, but we fail. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 it says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful you don't fall. Beware of self-confidence. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 12 it says, Glancing this way and that seeing no one, he killed the Egyptians and hid them in the sand. Excuse me. This was Moses because he was self-confident, because he was a, he was self-confident of his ability, and therefore he ended up failing. Be honest with yourself, admit your weakness to God, then turn them over to him and say, Lord, I am not doing well in this area of my Christian life. Don't be hard on yourself, but remember that God will forgive you and give you the grace and strength to go forward, but be honest with him. Campbell Morgan says, in other words, I know the worst that is in you, Peter, but if you trust me, in spite of the worst that is in you, I will realize all your highest aspirations and fulfill your life for you. God knows what you're like when he called you. And God has called you to change you. Revolutionary hope. We've seen revolutionary grace that God will bear with you and be graceful to you and will change you, but you've got to be honest with him and acknowledge your failures and your mistakes. And then rev revolutionary love, uh, revolutionary hope, verse 14, 1 to 4. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is in John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house and many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself and where I am you may be also and you know the way to where I am going. Judas failed. Peter had failed. And sometimes in life we fail and we wonder where God is in it. One writer, Curdy Evans, student, died in 18, 1982. The mum writes in 2003. I lay on the hospital bed with Curdy, for hours held between the wires and tubes, his brain dead but a live body. Don't scream, Heather, otherwise the nurse will drag you off him. Have you ever felt like that? She writes, at 4.30 in the afternoon, I walked out of the hospital. Why did I not scream the house down? She writes, grief is such a physical experience. No one tells you that it has all the symptoms of terror, but without the escape route of flight, it is a terror of the nightmare after the event and from which one can't wake up. She cries out in anger and desperation, please God, don't make me so alone. Why do we have to experience these difficult times? 
Jesus says in verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In Christ are the resources of God. When we think we have nothing, we have everything. Faith in Jesus was what would calm our heart to what lay ahead. Our trial shuts us up so we have to trust God. Then we realize he is God and all sufficient to get through. Because we lent on him, we looked to him, and he was faithful. Verse 2, it says that God, Jesus, has a prepared a place for us, many mansions. We need to get the big picture. We're going to spend life with Jesus in eternity, and that is the big picture. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. When we believe in Jesus, we are saved, and that is the big picture. We are going to glory. So I want to ask some questions here. No matter what happens to us, our resources are in Christ. No matter how dark the situation, no matter how despairing your situation is today, God has a place for you in heaven and God is with you right now your security and your joy is in Christ and so do we prize Christ 1927 Philip Larpentor von Ferrer a wealthy nobleman died and his stamp collection in 1921 was sold for two million dollars so it must have been a, an expensive stamp collection so he bought stamps and they sold in the 1921 for two million dollars. He really prized stamps. Little bits of paper, he prized them. Do you prize Christ, who is worth more than all the stamps in the world? Do you see him as everything in your life? Are you going to trust him in the midst of your suffering? So we come to the end. And we have four points here that we need to go over. Number one, glory. Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our iniquities. The death of Christ brought glory to God. It brought glory to the Son. Are we living for the glory of God today? Is the glory of Jesus more important to us than anything else? Then, revolutionary love. They love each other even without being acquainted with each other, says the ancient, says it was said about the ancient church. Are we a loving community as people of God? Revolutionary grace. Boris Pasternak said, I don't like people who have never fallen or stumbled. Their virtue is lifeless and isn't of much value. Life hasn't revealed its beauty to them. Chapter 13 in Dr. Shivago, Boris Pasternak. We all fail and we all make mistakes, but we need to come back to God, be honest with God and say, Lord, I'm failing in this area. Please help me. Not to be cocky, not to be self-reliant without God. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So revolutionary grace, God will forgive you and use you and restore you. And then revolutionary hope. You might feel the bottom has dropped out of your life and you might not see a way ahead. But Jesus says, let not your, let not your heart be troubled. In John chapter 14, 33, he says, my little children, as you live out the glory of God, as you live for the glory of God, as you live in the grace of Jesus, knowing his forgiveness, as you live in love and obedience to him, he will give you his hope. His peace will rest with you. However dark it is, however difficult it is, you have a hope today. You are going to glory. And everything might have been taken away from you at this present time. Maybe you have lost all your health and now you are on a hospital bed or now you can't do what you used to do. But you've not lost because as the earthly fades, you are going to the heavenlies. 
You are going to glory. You are going to be with your Father forever and ever and to worship and to adore Him forever. I hope this has been a blessing to you and I hope it's been an encouragement to you. Let's come before the Lord. Father, we thank you for your love and grace and I praise you and give you the glory. And I pray that this message will be a blessing to all those who hear it and may it be bring glory to your name. May people be saved and restored and renewed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. Uh, I've got three more messages, so we'll see how we do. God bless you. Hi, folks. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Let's come before the Lord and um, do the next uh, message. Let's come before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace and care and father we pray as we look at your word now that you bless us and encourage us in the name of our lord jesus christ and for your glory amen amen so if you turn to john 14 5 and 7 it says thomas said to him lord we do not know where you are going how can we know the way and jesus said to him i am the way the truth and the life, no one can come to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen you do know him and have seen him. So I just pray again. Father, we thank you for this day and your goodness and love. I just pray you'd empower me now and bless us, Lord, uh, as we come to round your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me. Okay. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. This is what an Indian, Indonesian pastor, about an Indian past, Indonesian pastor who was shot dead while speaking from the pulpit during an evening service. Four masked men who were ride by motorbikes opened fire with machine guns on the Reverend Sassini Tinelel and the worship team. Reverend Sassini, who was shot in the head, in the head, died instantly. Four teenage worshippers were hospitalized with serious injuries, and one 17-year-old girl is in a coma. The world doesn't like us standing for Jesus Christ as being the way, the truth, and the life. There's a cost in following Jesus. There's a cost in proclaiming him as the only way. And we can't get round that as a church. The church wants to placate the world, wants to make the world think that the church is not arrogant, that it, it is inclusive. But ultimately the gospel offends, ultimately the message of Jesus offends. In Daniel chapter 3.16 it says, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it and, we, and will rescue us from your hand, O king. Shadrach, Meshach were thrown into the fire by Nebuchadnezzar because he didn't like their message, he didn't like their religion. We have to face the fact that modern culture will not find the Christian message palatable. It will always find the message offensive and we have to face that fact. So first of all, the challenge of the church. Thomas here says, and Thomas said to him, Lord we do not know where we are going how can we know the way? Thomas isn't clear about Jesus, he isn't clear about the truth. And so Jesus has to say, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to Father but through me. And the challenge is the shirt for the church is to be clear about her message. If the trumpet blows an uncertain sound, who will hear? And the church has to declare a clear, bold, message of what she believes 
and be uncompromising in that boldness. And that's what you have to do today as a church. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Command and teach these things. We're to teach the people the word of God. We're to teach the people clearly what to believe. In 1 uh, Hebrews chapter 5, 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have some need, you have come to need milk and not solid food. And the challenge of the church when we're confronted with our challenges today is that we need to be growing from milk to food. We need to be growing from baby food to solid food. We need to be studying the Bible, getting to grips with it, and then being able to teach it to our generation. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. The Jehovah's Witnesses are successful because they prey on a church that doesn't know the word of God. We have to be people of the word. We have to be teaching the word of God, building people up in the word. The challenge of the church is to if we're going to know if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, we're only going to learn that from the Bible, and we have to be willing to teach the Bible to our generation. Secondly, the challenge of pluralism. It says in, in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. And our modern culture tells us that all religions are the same, that every religion is a value. No one religion is superior to another. But our faith offends because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. We have to be willing to speak out and say, no, Christ is the only way. Um, in Acts chapter 17, 22, Paul says, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. And then he says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on the subject in verse 32. So in Acts 17, he talks about all religions, but then he brings it home and says, Jesus rose from the dead. What are you going to do about it? Some got offended, some believed. And it's the same with you today. <coughs> You've got to be able to teach and be willing to preach and speak and say Jesus is the only way. Some will be believed and some will get offended. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven and earth given by man which must be saved. So we're, we're not an appreciation society where people come and just pat us on the back and say, aren't we lovely? We you agree with us in our in our society, you agree with everything we say. We're a proclamation society, we proclaim the truth, the gospel. So pluralism is a challenge to the church that we preach Christ. Secondly, there is a challenge of postmodernism. Postmodernism is a reaction against modernism, i.e. all knowledge is based on science. And so postmodernism re reacts against that. Postmodernism um, rejects objective truth. It it's skeptical of authority. It's looking for self-identity. It blames modernity for the problems. They are they live in a media world. They engage in a knowing smile. They are on a quest for unity. They live in a materialist world. They ask carefully to clarify what you say. They speak in positive language. They admit their weaknesses. They don't go looking for a fight. They talk about grey areas. 
Postmodernism is around. Many people like postmodernism. But again, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. And we have to be willing to proclaim the exclusivity of Christ in the midst of postmodernism. And in the end, postmodernism is, is intolerant because it says that it agrees with everything, but it doesn't agree with anything that challenges it. All right? So we mustn't be offended by postmodernism. You can actually learn some good things from postmodernism, but at the same time, if it strips away that Christ is exclusive, Christ really died and rose again, if it attacks those foundations, then postmodernism is dangerous. But postmodernism is a challenge, and we have to proclaim Jesus is the only truth. The next challenge is universalism. If we in Galatians chapter 1 it says they only heard this report that man who formerly persecuted is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy Matthew 15 19 it's analysis of human nature for out of the heart proceed of evil thoughts murders adulteries fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemy, these are the things which defile a man, Matthew 15, 19, 10. So those two scriptures in Galatians, it's talking about Paul was a blasphemer, yet he began to be converted and preach the gospel. The Lord talks about the deceitfulness of man. And universalism comes along and says, look, all this saying people are sinners and Jesus is to be preached. No, we don't we don't do that because in the end everybody's going to get saved. But uh, in Paul warns against this in two Timothy chapter three, one and five. But Mark there will be terrible times in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful and unholy. Scriptures clearly teach that there is a wrath to come, that there is a judgment, that Christ is the only way to get saved. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And these challenges we face today we find that we, we are challenged by the lack of education within the church about the gospel. We're challenged by pluralism. We're challenged by postmodernism. And we're challenged by universalism. But let us turn to Jude in conclusion. Let us turn to Jude it says this Jude the servant of Jesus Christ the brother of James to them that are sanctified by God and Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied beloved when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was come once delivered unto the saints we must earnestly contend for the faith that is to say that there's only one gospel that gospel is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through the death and resurrection 
and belief in Jesus Christ. And we have to contend against pluralism, we have to contend against postmodernism, we have to contend against anything that would set itself up against that gospel. We have to proclaim the gospel clearly and boldly and teach it to every generation and pass the baton on. And I ask a question and that is this. Do you know what the gospel is and are you passing it on? Are you training your people, your young people, to pass on the gospel? Otherwise, if you do not, they will fall under universalism. They will fall under postmodernism. They will fall under pluralism. And the gospel will be destroyed. So, Romans 5, it says, Therefore, seeing we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Through who? Buddha? No. Through Muhammad? No. Through Dawkins? No. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to get saved. Thank you for listening and God bless you.